So welcome everybody to the first edition of The Power of Story with Tim Lott. So Tim got in touch a week or two ago to talk about this series, talk about the thing that he's really passionate about and we've interviewed him about on the channel before, which is great stories, myth, and the structure of stories. And Tim, if you're not aware, if you haven't seen any of the interviews with Tim, he's an award-winning writer. He won the Whitbread Book Award for his first book, first novel, and also teaches storytelling. So Tim, welcome. And this is a new series. What are you hoping to achieve through it? I'm hoping to achieve something that I've been trying to achieve for years and will never cease trying to achieve it because it's a bottomless subject is to get to the is to get to the base of what a story really is and how it works both in fiction and drama and in our own personal lives and one could even think of it in therapeutic terms but i've become very um taken with the idea of living, as it were, in a sea of story. John York, our guest today, a very brilliant man, um, it was one of the people who helped me to understand how deep this, this story instinct in human beings goes. Um, that's an intellectual interest. It's also a practical interest since I write novels for a living. Um, I'm always trying to unlock the secrets of what makes a story come alive. Um, it's something nobody really knows. If you ever watched a dud movie into which millions of dollars have been poured and yet it's as dead as a beached whale, you'll know that there's really no ultimate solution to this question and that's what makes it so fascinating for me. So for me, it's going to be an ongoing uh, investigation with some of the chief figures uh, in storytelling, not just story theorists and TV producers uh, and showrunners like John, um, but also hopefully actors, thinkers, mythologists, um, anybody really who can talk to me about their take on how story works in, in a kind of abstract way, but also I want it to be practical for people who, who try and tell stories themselves, which seems to be just about everybody. I teach stories, so I know what a huge demand there is out there for people trying to write their own stories and their own novels and their own screenplays and hopefully come up with some key points on how they might profitably use some of the principles of storytelling um, in their own work. John, um, let me bring you uh, in here. Thank you for, for attending this. I know that your real field of expertise is both teaching screenwriters. You, I think, run the BBC Academy or did, um, the Screenwriting Academy. Um, and uh, you can, as I know to my cost, talk about story theory uh, to in great detail. And one last um, mention for John, if you don't know him, not only has he written that wonderful book, he was really rescued um, that great soap opera EastEnders from the doldrums at one point. He <laughs> founded Shameless, Life on Mars, worked on Wolf Hall, the list is endless. He's a great man. He's got multiple BAFTAs. And uh, I'm going to start by throwing him in the deep end by asking him, uh, what is a story, John? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for the build-up, which I'll never live up to. And a good, 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 uh, good morning, good evening to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, what is a story? Uh, well, you can approach that answer from any number of uh, ways. Uh, stories are chains of cause and effect lassoed around a truth would be one definition. The stories are the pursuit of a goal through the forces of antagonism would be uh, another definition. Or stories are the way, my favorite definition of a story, but are units of knowledge weaponized for, the, for maximum transmiss transmissibility, transmission. Okay, so when you talk about- Units of knowledge, that's good. Those, those are three quite, profound but also quite complex um, 
explanations, I think, for about why, how, what stories are. So perhaps we could unpack them a little bit. So when you say it's it's about the transmission of knowledge or information, it, it's it's a way of people learning things in a slightly um, off beam or or, or, or non didactic way. Is that is that one of the ways you would put it? Yeah, if you, if you, if I mean, the, the way to think about it is to, is to go back in time to have to, to the to, to, to the basics. Is stories are an oral tradition, you know, and stories are were used historically to transmit information to your tribe and to define the tribe. You know, every tribe has a story. Every country has a foundation myth. You know, it's very common, and every tribe has one. Um, but fundamentally, it's, it's to pass on information quickly that binds the tribe together, whether it's information about danger or information about where we are in the world, mythology. You know, you look at the sky, the story of why the stars are there, the, 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 the Norse myths and the Greek myths, or whatever you like, a basic mythology. They're all stories giving us knowledge. It's not necessarily empirical knowledge, but it's the knowledge that people traditionally needed to survive. Now, the thing about stories is they, they're not rational. They, they work on an emotional level. That's their power. They're designed to work emotionally. They bypass rationality. They bypass due diligence. Um, and that's why they're so successful, because they're so quick to transmit and so easy to persuade people if they're doing that. So if you take any story, the, the, the basic unit of the story is a unit of learning. In drama, we see this, what does a character learn? They learn that empathy is good. They learn that greed is bad, or it's opposite, obviously. Uh, you want to pass that knowledge on. How do you pass that on? Well, you can sit there rationally and prove it scientifically, or you can tell a story that goes, oh, my God, that's true. That's much more powerful. And so basically, it's, it's yeah, stories are the way we pass on knowledge of what it's like to be somebody else and why you need to understand that too. So, in a sense, it, it's a, it's a evolutionary strategy hmm. at, at, at one level, um, yeah. presumably an unconscious one, since nobody, you know, sat down and thought, "Let's tell a story." It's something that would have happened as naturally as bees making honey, I suppose. You know, that the that, 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 that the human being once having discovered language um, in sufficient complexity would start to construct narratives with that language rather than just using it for um for practical purposes like give me give me that give give me give me that club so i can beat that dinosaur <laughs> to death although i know that there weren't in fact dinosaurs around at the same time um but um they, they are in the flintstones um uh and um uh so this idea that story is, who, you know, who who was the first storyteller, or who? I mean, abstract it. How might it have come about? Did somebody just sit down once around the campfire and tell a story? I mean, is that? I mean, there's no way we can know this, but obviously there were cave paintings fifty thousand years ago that told a sort of story, yeah. I guess, and that had a had a narrative to it. So this narrative instinct is, is lies very deep within us. And, and we all do it, don't we, whether we're professional storytellers or not. There's yeah. no stopping it. No, I mean, it's as basic as breathing, I think. I mean, you, you know, even my four-year-old child you know, can tell a story. He will tell me a story about what he's done. You know, the, the basic elements are <laughs> the, the structure of story mimics the process of perception. So it's really basic. So, for example, um, you listen to me and you change. That's three acts, effectively. That, that's storytelling. You know, I'm, you're, 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 you exist, you receive knowledge, that knowledge changes you. For good or bad, even if you're disagreeing with me, that's fine. That's the basic unit of story. What then happens is you tell stories um, as you tell stories, you start to learn what is going to have more impact. Okay, so a good storyteller or a bard or whoever it is in your tribe who's telling the story is the one who understands best how to structure a story to make it as engaging and entertaining as possible, but also carry the message they want to get across, which can be a warning about 
dinosaurs or clubs, but it can also be a, it can also be an opposite. It's an, it's an instrument of power. You know, stories are incredibly powerful weapons. Right, absolutely. So there's two things there. Firstly, that the famous three act structure, which we will come to later, I suppose, dramatic structure, um, set up conflict resolution, you might say. Um, that's rooted in the, it reflects the rational process, the didactic process within the human mind. And that's why it's kind of inescapable, really. Yeah. Um, it's also a form of power. So stories hand power to those who control the stories, Yeah, you might say. And that's, that's true, I guess, in the earliest times when we evolved out of, let's say, small scale stories, when we were discussing about, you know, Ugg's battle with the woolly, woolly mammoth and how he defeated him, to a story about how we transcend mortality what our lives mean, what the stars represent. And this is when stories go from the private and individual and take on a societal level and become myths and, and religions. Yeah, yeah, all of them are predicated on a story, aren't they? It's all, of, all of them are narratives, fundamentally. Right. A okay. narrative that makes sense of the world that often defies rational analysis. Yes, although it's argued, I mean, we tend to think as moderns um, that all those myths from so long ago um, were people that pre-scientific people who didn't really understand how the world operated in technical terms um, were making stuff up. But I'm sure you would argue, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but even though, as you say, the stories were not rooted in anything, they weren't real gods, for instance, nevertheless, the stories in a, in, in a psychological sense were correct. Would you, would you say that's fair? Uh, yeah, I mean, you get into a lot of arguments about definition and what correct means. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, they're, they're, they're psychological projections. I mean, religions are psychological projections. You know, you know it's, it's just like mother figure. Father figure, Virgin Mary. It's it's pretty clear. Um, you know, it's a it, it, you're 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 imposing your inner inner demons or your inner curios on 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 an external framework that makes the world make sense to you. Now, you know, the stories are about creating order. A good story reduces chaos to order. That's what that's what storytelling is, and of course, that's what religion is. That's but also that's what conspiracy theory is as well. And indeed, a lot of current um, I mean, you and I would call it political correctness, is really born of the same religious instincts to order the world. It's as deeply unscientific as, as previous religions, the more rational of us may, might laugh at nowadays. You know, the religious input instinct never goes away because it's a storytelling instinct. Yes, so, so in, in that sense, we are wrong to dismiss the ancients as people who didn't have enough knowledge about the way the world worked and made up their, their gods and furies and so forth. We're just as religious ourselves yeah. today because we're also telling stories on the basis of limited information, really, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, what we tend to do, ex exposed to anything new, and if you think about this, if, you, if, you, if you're exposed to a new piece of news, what you will do almost immediately is you will find a hero and you will find a villain. You will search for a hero in the story, someone who probably supports your point of view, and you will search for a villain. You know, it's, it's really basic. You know, the storytelling thing is good is and bad is that very binary instinct it just happens almost immediately you're exposed to any new information. Uh, it's, it's that, that instinct. That's that, that, yes, absolutely. And, and, of course, another good example, I can't remember if it's your example or I picked it up somewhere else, is that if you walk into your front room and unexpectedly there's a, a large, beautifully wrapped parcel, you will immediately tell a story about it. So you will not just ignore that parcel. And, 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 you know, there has to be a, why is it there? Who put it there? What's going to happen when I open it? Immediately a story is going to emerge. Yeah, you'll impose a chain of causation. That you can't explain, you know, so... 
Okay, good. So we, we've worked out then that stories are measures of, uh, 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 in some ways, weapons of control, some ways weapons of explanation. Um, certainly entertainment, we mustn't forget that um, too. Um, what about um, what about in the sense of the meanings that these stories carry, which I mean, according to somebody like Joseph Campbell or, or, or Carl Jung, these stories carry within them that sort of a common DNA that kind of pops up wherever you look, certainly in classic stories going back, you know, to to, to Homer and the, and the Bible and, and all the way up to Star Wars and Harry Potter, what you're really seeing is the same inflection of the same patterns over and over again. Is, is, is that something you subscribe to? Well, yes and no. I mean, I, I mean, the hero's journey, I think you're, you're sort of referring to, is, yeah. is a common pattern which sort of grows out of Joseph Campbell uh, and then is articulated by George Lucas and then Christopher Vogler. It's become a very common trope in screenwriting. I mean, I mean the, do, I think... I think the hero's journey is a story imposed on structure, ironically. Uh, and yeah, so it's a pattern that works very well, but it's a pattern by which stories are structured. So if you if you if you if you look at Joseph Campbell, um, he describes all stories as a search for an elixir. Uh, you go into the forest or into the woods or wherever, uh, and you do far from lands, and you find a secret in a dark cave, and you extract that secret. And you take it home. That is Joseph Campbell. He says that's the um, uh, the, the monomyth. He calls it. But that's that's story structure. That's what all stories do. You know, all stories are about a journey out of yourself. I am a child trapped in my own head to go on a journey to discover. Oh, there's a match. Touch the match. Ouch! Fire is hot. I return that news back to my head. That's a hero's journey. So, so, so the hero's journey is a lovely fable we wrapped around the story process, you know, which is why some people are very sceptical about it because, because they're not seeing the story process part of it. Yes, uh, uh, but, but of course um, the, the Joseph Campbell template is, um, is more complex than the three-act structure. It has, yeah, there's it has more stages. Many, many, many more parts. Yeah, but fun fundamentally, you can trace them back to the same shape. It's like if you look at Vladimir Prop in Russian formalism and talk about students, I think there's 38 parts to the Russian folktale. But they're the same. You overlay them over the top of each other. They're all so everyone's articulating the same fundamental binary shape, which is child sees fire, learns fire is hot. Okay, but I mean, even within that. Let's, let's, I mean, would it be fair to say that when you teach story yourself, hmm. you come from more a, what you might call a classic Aristotelian background <laughs> than, than, a, than, than you might say a Campbell Jungian approach to, to storytelling? Would, would that, because they're, they're kind of slightly different ways of looking at story, aren't they? Well, I think, I think all of those, I mean, it sounds incredibly arrogant for me to say this, but I think they all suffer from confirmation bias. I think all of those theories, you know, like they have a theory, you go, oh, well, I'll make it fit. I mean, Jungian theory fits to a certain extent. The hero's journey certainly fits in a gross way. But, you know, I think they're metaphors. I don't think they're interpretations. I think they're metaphors for story structure. And you can take them all them as you will. You know, Jung is going to think that because it fits Jungian theory. Campbell is going to think that because it fits his theory about the monomyth. We all use confirmation bias all the time. But, you know, fundamentally, they're all articulating basic story shape, which is I exist, I perceive the outside world, I change. They're all the same thing. Well, that's, that touches on a very important element of storytelling, I think, um, which is that, um, well, before I say this, um, it's worth mentioning, I suppose, that Aristotle was the first story theorist, I suppose. Yeah. He was the first man who came up with, a, well, the beginning, the middle and the end. You know, yeah. and there's a lot more. We won't go into that now. 
Um, but 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 the central trope of a, a successful story, I suppose, is change. Mm. Change is a huge thing. Stories are about managing change, are they not? Uh, yeah, I mean, but the other word for change is knowledge, is learning, isn't it? Characters change because they learn. So it's the same thing. It's just looking at it through a different lens. It's the, it's the same thing. But yeah, absolutely. Stories cannot exist without change. And certainly in drama, every scene is a unit of change. That's the reason the scene exists. If there's no change, the scene shouldn't be there. Yes, and when we talk about change within a scene or in a story, what kinds of change are we talking about? I mean, you've mentioned a change of perception, but there's a change of um, an emotional change, often about, you know, many stories, for instance, are about the shift from pride to humility. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's it, you, because, um, I hope you're mis misunderstanding, but talking about change in, in a, as it were, as if it were a, a didactic process, um, uh, 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 it's it's far more. It's it really taps into the emotions, doesn't it? That's why stories are so successful when they're successful, in in that they move us. Yeah, and and it's, so it's not simply a question of teaching us in the way that a teacher would teach us something. It's tapping into some root or some source that that can move us to tears or anger or pity, as Aristotle would have it, hmm. about people we don't know and who are entirely fictional. And that's rather magical, isn't it? Oh, it's amazing, yeah. It, it's an extraordinary process, and, but you can use it about real people as well. I mean, you, I mean I'm, I'm obsessed with, I, I don't know if people know the story of Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos, um, the, the, the Silicon Valley company which she set up to, 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 to revolutionize healthcare by sampling blood uh, in, in using tiny little samples. You know, they're, they're, you know, those machines were going to be in every Walmart across America. Um, uh, and she's a young, very attractive, which is important significantly in the way she managed to persuade people. Uh, she seems to be brilliant. She models herself on Steve Jobs and she convinces it, the most powerful people in the world, you know, like, like George Schultz, you know, Reagan's Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger to be on her board. It's an amazing story. This young girl is going to revolutionize the world's healthcare. Mm. It's also a complete fantasy because she wasn't, it was a lie. She told a little lie, they go into a bigger line before she knew it escalated into into a, a, a catastrophically dangerous uh, company. It's a real person. But everyone was so fixated on the story that it, 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 it allowed them to remove the process of due diligence. And that's what I mean about stories are weaponized. They're weaponized units of learning because they appeal directly to the emotion. They make you laugh, they make you cry. And if they make you cry and you make you cry, it's like populist politicians. And they're not rational. Populism never works. Fascism never works, but it's so appealing emotionally to people who want order in their lives and feel hard done by. It's the same process, which is both the power and the danger of narrative. You know, they're hugely moving. It's a, you know, Trump appeals entirely emotionally. It's a very powerful story if, you're, if you want to be Donald Trump. Well, just briefly touch on politics. Um... Uh, because I don't think that's really going to be our focus, but I think it's certainly very relevant. Um, oh, yeah. Someone like Trump, a lot of it is in the slogan, isn't it? I mean, make America great again is a story. Yeah, it's a um, story. Keep things the same is not. Same with Brexit. Um, take back control is a story. Leave things alone is not. Um, so the, 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 the great power of, of a narrative as it were, moving forward through time is what appeals to us, the idea that things... Change, yeah, change, and through that le learning learning the truth. I mean, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, for, for, for whatever flaws you may find in Donald Trump, he, he had a natural instinctive genius for storytelling. You know, if I said to you, come up with a story in four words, you'd be hard-pressed to come up with be something better than Make America Great Again. So does this gonna... mean... I'm sorry, does this mean we're all extremely manipulable yeah 
Oh God, yeah. I mean, and 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 what's more terrifying now is you know we grew up. People our age too grew up in a world where stories were moderated by broadcasters and they had to meet very exacting standards of truth. That's gone. Anyone can broadcast a story that can go all the way around the world. They don't need a publisher now. They're not susceptible to the rules of libel. You know, the, 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 the most extraordinary development was, was when they decided in Clinton's time to not see Facebook and then Twitter later as a publisher. So they weren't responsible for its broadcast. And that unleashed the tsunami, this babel of stories that have, you know, like, had really profound consequences on our world. Absolutely. Um, I mean, we're in a very unique place in, in history at the moment. Yeah. Um, but let's let's perhaps say that for another another occasion. <laughs> okay, um, I, 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 apart from anything else, it's, it's too depressing. Um, <laughs> True. Uh, but, to 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 talk about the I I I'm I'm minded of the of the one of the examples you give in in your terrific lectures about the way that stories are and certainly in the case of the monomyth stories are repeated over and over again and just for a little bit of light entertainment I know you haven't got your slides with you but you 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 posit that Star Wars and Harry Potter are exactly the same story um, yeah. uh, pretty much could you could you just Pin that down for us. <laughs> From memory. Oh, Tim. Uh, yeah, well, you know, they're both orphans. Okay, they're both lost children. They both have fathers uh, um, who haunt their past. They're, they're both given a magic wand. One is a lightsaber, one is a magic wand. Uh, they both go on a journey against a giant force of evil. One is Voldemort, one is Darth Vader. Uh, they both learn to trust in a, in a force or a higher power that allows them to do something previously unimaginable, like destroy the Death Star or win the Quidditch match and fundamentally destroy Voldemort. Uh, yeah, I mean, every single stage of the stories are, are, are identical, um, which is lovely. I mean, it, you know, and, and as you can wrap Cinderella into that as well. Um, I mean, no, it's, you know, J.K. Rowling did not plagiarise George Lucas. But we're all working from the same template, and you can call that the hero's journey if you like. But it's fundamentally the stages of learning. A child, you know, a boy learns how to be a man, is the story, and is rewarded um, with faith, if you like. They're, they're very religious stories as well, aren't they? Um, so, 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 yeah. Uh, but it's you can say exactly the same thing about Jane Eyre. It's, that's exactly the same story. A girl becomes a woman, follows exactly the same template. And, and that's, these are very inspiring stories that we all enjoy and come out feeling elevated, you know, by the possibility of change and that we can transcend our dreary life on Tatooine or, or, or whatever that dreadful street that Harry Potter lives in um, and, and, and become something exciting and real. How does it work with 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 something like uh, tragedies, however, which 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 leave us feeling, you know, that that life is 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 can be disastrous. I mean, what what does it appeals to us about that? Why why will we sit and watch tragedies? Uh, well, they've got they're kind of cautionary tales. And also, like you know, you put you you lend your mind to a dark place and you go on a journey uh and you enjoy that journey quite a lot while you're going on it but you're sort of punished metaphorically at the end which is a cathartic experience fundamentally it's a kind of catharsis isn't it i mean the 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 you know the the tragic story shape is just the hero's journey flipped on its head you know, they're, they're very very similar but the units have learned they're cautionary tales that are designed right. to scare and titillate and excite you but warn you off greed is bad Ambition will destroy you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and what about in stories like, you know, uh, the modern, shall we call it, the cult of amorality, in which we're, which we're apparently we're not trying to get a moral message across in the way that cowboys and Indians, as they were once called, <laughs> um, fought each out, other out, and you, you know, and 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 the the, the law always won. Now we have anti-heroes, and now we have sometimes what looks like 
the forces of of evil, if not triumphing, then certainly not necessarily being defeated. What's going on there? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, Christopher Booker would argue, who wrote The Seven Basic Plots, which is a fascinating book, would argue that, that this is the decline of morality, of Christian morality, um, post the Industrial Revolution, uh, which led forth to a sea of sin, basically, I think, <laughs> paraphrasing it slightly. Um, um, you know, stories were very simple originally. They, they, if you do this, you will go to heaven. If you do this, you will go to hell. You know, and 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 carried on like that. But, you know, the stories built someone up towards sexual union, which was the ultimate goal of most stories in that time. Marriage, which was effectively happy ever after. So there's clearly a a primal role going on there. But what's going on left is like you know, if you leave a nation um, happy for too long someone will want to prod it in the eye. There'll be young men or women who will want to go, no. And that's what's happening. Is like, you know, I'm going to define myself by being against you. I cannot define myself in a sea of neutrality. I will define myself by creating a persona that is against you. Stories give you definition. So you talk about stories give you mental health. Stories give you definition, tell you who you are. And in a sea of, in a world where people are broadly happy and prosperous and have, have enough to eat and can stay warm and sleep at night, um, that's a bit boring. Mm. So, so why not kick against it? I mean, yeah, I mean, I, you were a child of punk rock, too. Hard to believe now, but uh, you know, in fact, um, and didn't you? You named a band, didn't you? Like, uh, you know, I named an album. Oh, that's right. Yeah, the Jesus are cool. <laughs> Nick Lowe. And if you know this, Tim, Tim is an old punk. Um, but punk was like, anyway, let's not dwell on that. But the, 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 the um, uh, you know, punk was a classic definition of like mostly middle class kids in a very prosperous society, really needing something to kick against, which gave them definition and purpose. Gleefully, wonderfully. And, but that's the same amor- am- amorality comes out of that he's like this great shocking somebody else is wow look at me Kevin, Kevin what's Martino. always worried me about these sort of story theories in some sense in, in and or vexes me i suppose is that if everything's just a story what's true well that's that's the perennial question isn't it that's the postmodern dilemma you might say. it is the postmodern dilemma because yeah we can i mean you know i mean in the end don't trust <sighs> Don't trust the story, you trust the data. You know, stories are generally lies. Um, and, and some of those are lies to reach a bigger truth, and that's fantastic. But you know, one of the things I've learned in television is, is years as a commissioning editor or anything else, is like, you know, there's always a story. You know, I mean, when I was young, there was a commissioning editor uh, in the UK who said, there has never been a successful drama that has featured the sea. Uh, because there have been two, three hits in a row, three, three expensive shows in a row that had failed because they were set by the sea. So he decided, it's the story instinct, that the sea is the reason the dramas were failures. It's rubbish, because, of <laughs> course, that had nothing to do with it. That, that was it. Little, they were just bad stories, badly made. You know, it, 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 setting a drama by the sea makes no difference whatsoever but that's the story instinct and a lot a lot of us we use the story instinct all the time where we should be looking at data yeah and you find this all throughout twitter you find this a lot in the current world and particularly with the narratives around me too and black lives matter again which are very important things but they're 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 narratives they're not data-based reactions but data is not much use when it comes to matters of value I mean, you know, um, let's take the most popular of Western story, the story of Christ, um, which one can take, you know, in a in a in a non-literal way and still find a lot of meaning in it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can say that's a lie, but but you could also say that there, are, as there are in Shakespeare, great truths, yeah, um, buried in them, uh, and therefore. You know, you, you you say that it's data where you'll find the truth, but maybe that's not sufficient. No, well, it's not. I mean, you, you probably need both. Also, you like it's, you, data can be incredibly selective. You know, it must be selective. 
Yeah, but, you know, you, you, I mean, just for example, and forgive the parochial British attitude here again at the moment, there's a big debate going on the Labour Party in Britain about why we lost, and the left have a narrative and the right have a narrative. Neither of those are supported by any sensible, wide-reaching internal polling. They have nothing to do with the real truth. No, and, and no one seems to be interested in the real truth. They're interested in their story, which props up their tribe. You know, so 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 you need you need a story instinct to recognize story, but also be able to to recognize when the stories are true. But also, you need proper scientific data. You need to all have all the tools at our disposal that allow us to analyze empirically and objectively the real world. And those things are largely boring, so people don't want to engage in those. Right. Oh, and okay. as David said, here isn't science a story? Yeah, science is a story too. They're all stories. That's the trouble. In the end, the world is fundamentally unknowable. So we interpret it out of our previous existence and imposing a narrative. Onto the world. Right. Uh, well, okay. Um, I'm, 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 I'm slightly more dubious than you about the value of data. Although I can obviously, I can definitely see that it's crucial for getting objective views of things. But story tells us not you know what's happening but what's important yeah and what isn't important it's about it's fundamentally about values isn't it let's 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 throw um throw a few bones if that's not a disparaging <laughs> way of putting it to I, people have will have um attended this seminar if we can call it that um for a number of reasons uh, some of them will be wanting to write stories so let's 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 ask a few questions that that might give them some 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 help. I mean, we talked about the importance of change in a story uh, and how that's very important. Though not all protagonists have to undergo a change in order for it to be a good story. Um, Miss Jean Brodie, for instance, doesn't undergo any change, you might say, um, and neither does the Great Gatsby. Um, or not any psychological change anyway. Um, well, maybe Gatsby does. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, if, you're creative, if you want to write a story that people are going to like, other than going to look at your books on story structure and, and your, your books on mythic heroes' journeys, how, how do you write what's the what's the most important pointers you can give for people who want to tell fictional stories i mean the sort of headlines if you like well the the headline is is just right it has to be just right i mean there's there's you know the, the structure is not something imposed from without by a book structure the, the shape of stories comes from within it's it's a human, uh, it's a primal construct. So, so you know, that's why nine-year-olds can tell a perfectly formed story because it's innate, you know, because it's built around the process of learning. So, so just write, you know, and 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 I mean, obviously, it depends on what medium you're looking at. If it's novels, you know, if it's if it's film, then you know, you obviously you need to familiarise yourself with the basic tenets around those things. But you'll be familiar with them maybe from watching them or or reading them. You can go on all kinds of courses. You can certainly do that, but in the end, it's like it comes from practice. It's like learning a musical instrument. Just there's you can have an instinct for it, but you practice and hone and refine it. Um, you can read about it and research it, but in the end, it's like what do you have to say? What are you trying to say? You know, the best writers. I mean, it sounds awful. The best writers tend to be the most damaged in a lot of ways because they're writing. There's an emotional need. They have to write. They have to make sense of the world. They cannot rest until the world is made safe. But we've all got passions or flaws or anxieties that, that should fuel our narratives. So it's tapping into those, emotional honesty. Or you can write fantasy as well, but even that's rooted in emotions. So I think, you know, I mean, you could, yeah, all the things, all the courses, of course, you can do all these, read everything, but in the end, just write, just write every day. Yeah, somebody once said, I can't remember who it was, that the secret of um, writing fiction was to work out what you wanted to say 
and then not say it, <laughs> um, which I thought was quite good. And yeah, I, good. I think you've met you, you've you've met different nine year olds to me, because children when they tell me stories are pretty boring, um, because they don't have they don't understand story. And the reason they don't understand story is they something you referred to earlier is, is cause and effect. Um, their stories kind of ramble on going nowhere. Uh, you know, I, I saw a dog and I threw a bone and then I came home and I had some baked beans and then I saw Freddy and he he tickled me and then I, the cat came in. And these are a series of events. But that's, that's a story, but it's not a plot, is it? Uh, no, but I think you've got a darker view of children than I have. You know, well, you got I, I went to nursery and I came home and it was good. It's rather touching and lovely, I think. Yeah, they're lovely stories. They're absolutely charming, but you're not, you'll have trouble selling them to a network. Well, no, that's fine. But, yeah, they don't need to worry about earning a living just yet. But if I do want to earn a living, John, yeah. um, what kind of disciplines do I need to understand? And I presume one of those things is, you know, we've talked about structure, but also um, we've got to talk about causality, don't we? I mean, you know, you mentioned that yourself. Yeah. A uh, 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 cause and effect wrapped around or something or other. I can't quite remember what it was. Lassoed around a truth. <laughs> yeah, I've never really understood that um, metaphor. But anyway, um, well, you could ask I, me and I could explain it. To okay. You. <laughs> no, please don't. Um, uh, but um, tell what is it about cause and effect that that that, that makes it crucial to to a, a story, as it were. Well, it's, it's, uh, just briefly, I. Uh, Looking in the in the in the chat room, and Ingmar says it very well. You know, you know, sto stories are this thing happened because of the previous thing. Incidents are, and then, and then, and then. Uh, there's no cause and effect. You can remove any. But it doesn't make any difference to the story. Stories are causal. That's what makes them different. You know, and yeah, there's a lot of films that do go and then, and then, and then. Nomadland being one of them. Right. Well, you know, not a personal favourite of mine, I have to say. Um, call, it, 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 it's it, they're chains of cause and effect wrapped, wrapped around a truth. It's important. It's a unit of knowledge that they're selling because it says this this causal journey will lead you to this. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, I haven't seen Nomad Land, but I'm, I'm, I'll take your word for it. And it's not yeah. it's not unusual for movies and, and literature to be acausal um, uh, or acausal um, and, um, and just be um, episodic, uh, if you like. Uh, and, and the argument, I suppose, that the filmmaker or writer would, would make was, well, that's what life is like. Um, but in fact, and which is, which is true, but it doesn't make for a very gripping narrative sometimes. Perhaps. Right. We, we, we don't, we're not gripped by life as it is because we all live that life you know and it's chaotic and unpredictable and shapeless um yeah but that's the point of stories isn't it stories give you shape yeah yeah um now obviously the protagonist is the most important character in any story or protagonists if there's there's more than one mm -hmm. Uh, what is it for you that, that makes for a successful or engaging protagonist? What's the secret of creating one that, 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 that the audience are going to re respond to? Well, you know, you watch, sorry to go on about four-year-olds, uh, but, you know, you watch a, a story, a four-year-old watching a story, they, are, they either want to become the protagonist or they stop watching. That's it fundamentally is is basically the scientific explanation is your mirror neurons kick in in a story where you fall in love with the protagonist or you empathize with the protagonist, your brain waves start to behave as if you are in the story. And so you are threatened by those things. So it's a scientific basis of empathy fundamentally. But yeah, it's that empathy is in any great story is 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 empathy with the protagonist is at the heart of it. Which is why you think about the stories you listen to as a child, or you watch as a child, or you read as a child, why those heroes are so vivid and so powerful. And even today, although we may pretend we're better than that, really, in the end, you know, you respond to very primal protagonists, really. 
So having empathy for the characters is very important. Um, hence the title, I think, of that Blake Snyder book, Save the Cats. Do you want to explain what that, what saving the oh, cats? Oh, that's uh, bless, bless Blake Snyder. That's his thing, you know, like, you know, like you, I think he slightly confuses empathy and love. Which, are, which most people do, to be honest, because they're not the same thing. But but he's basically saying, and it's great. I love the book. I think it's great. Uh, it is um, you know, in order you need to love the central protagonist. So very early on in the story, you need them to see him save a cat because then they'll be lovable. Right, that, and that is on page twenty eight, I think, it is or something like that. You have to have them save oh, the yeah, cat. Probably. It did in fact. Yeah, yeah. The, and oh. there's there's a certain truth to that. But you know, it it, it ignores the fact that we can empathise with very dark motives. And say something about um, desire as well, because I think one of your points is is that what moves a character forward is is, is desire that they want something, you know, and they want it badly, you know. And that's if you're writing or trying to create a story, you can do worse than create a create a, a, a hero or heroine, you know, that has a has a powerful desire. That's that's. That's um I certainly noticed that it's it's often lacking in manuscripts that I read. <laughs> um is is that is that things, you know, events happen, but they don't seem to matter because the, the, the main character doesn't seem to want anything particularly. Yeah, I mean there's a kind of like ennui about a lot of contemporary novels, aren't there? Um I mean in, in film it's really important because the you know, like what drives the story is the protagonist's desire. In novels, it's it, it's not essential because the narrator will provide the desire, um, the desire to finish the telling of the story. So you're driven by the narrator or the narrative voice. So it's one of the problems when you're adapting novels with characters with no external desire, you suddenly find that they're really boring in film and television. They just, they don't, they, they don't work. You know, but the key thing, I mean, Chris McQuarrie, who does the Mission Impossible films and wrote Usual Suspects, you know, had like, he was asked, you know, what, what, what central tenet do you absolutely need to create a successful character? And quick as a flash, he said, um, do I give a shit about what they want? Yeah. And that is the golden rule of certainly all film and television storytelling. An audience will watch if, I mean, yeah, I'm you know, streamlining this answer a little bit, but they will, they will watch absolutely if they identify with the protagonist's object of desire, if they want it to. Okay, um, very good, John. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're coming up to the nine, nine o'clock mark. Is that right, David? Or, or should I should I carry on for a bit, which I could e easily do? Or do you want to yeah. to the? Um... Yeah, we've got um, about three or four questions here. Um, why don't we come to a question? And if there's if there's time afterwards, people can also add more questions to the chat. And we'll potentially come to those in the next within the next half an hour as well. Um, but I think the first one um, there was a, and I, I'm interested in this as well, Tim, because obviously you're a working journalist, and there was a lot of interest in the chat, a lot of comments around journalism. And Tom Armstrong had a, a question around this. Tom, would you like to unmute yourself and ask sure. your question? I can post it in the chat again for. Sure, yeah. Hi, guys. Um, thanks for all of that. Um, yeah, my question was, what does this all mean for journalistic idea, ideals of objectivity and truth-seeking? Like, is, is reporting just adding another layer of story on top of storytelling all the way up to the top? And the way I, can, I think I can illustrate that is, like, if you're reporting on a conflict, you just have two groups with opposing stories that who both think they're the hero. And then, like, what's the effect of of journalism then if it's like what's what's it then doing <laughs> a very very good question um i'll have a go since i've worked for a journalist as a journalist for a long time and then john will have insights too i'm sure um but yeah i mean certainly stories journalists have always referred to their collection of facts being arranged as a story um underlying that once upon a time, and to some extent still, there's a professional ethic to reach for something called objective truth, um, which you could uh, which you could approach without actually ever being able to possess. To, to my mind, 
and this is the story I tell myself, that um, that ethic, that professional ethic is decaying, um, partly driven by the technical setup that newspapers and media outlets are chasing clicks. So they're more and more reliant on telling stories that people want to hear. And that is less and, 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 and you know, the true stories, you know, people don't want to hear, it seems, a, a nuanced story. People want to hear a story um, that supports their biases. Uh, and that's the way that technology and commerce are working now. Um, so I suspect if you put that and add it with the intellectual fashion of of postmodernism, which says that there is no objective truth anyway, that you leave yourself in a in a, in a tribalized media arena where journalists are becoming culture warriors, um, rather than necessarily collators of data and fact, which they try and lay out in as an objective a way as possible, um, which I think is a very dangerous um, tendency. John, what do you think? Well, I, you know, I, I grew up in a, in, in a BBC that was schooled in exactly this question, Tom. It's like it, 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 it suffused every conversation and every argument. It's like, how do you tell the truth about a situation? Uh, and, and it was very rigorous um, while also knowing that it was doomed to fail. You know, there, there was there was always that sense about it that you know, we must aspire to do this because this is the most responsible way. We must convey the truth. Each journalist is a protagonist in going into a forest to observe and verify, and verify being the key word, the key facts of this situation, and tell them in a, in a story that, that conveys an emotional truth about the situation. Uh, and the key, you know, that's a very expensive way of doing journalism, particularly because you have to verify everything and everything has to be double sourced. Um, and it's a school of journalism that is dying, that is still there. But the, so, but the answer is, I think to, to your point is, that is probably the closest we're ever going to get. It will never be perfect. And it's something we should support at all costs. You know, I mean, you know, everyone will have different views of public broadcasting and I completely get that. But one of the things I think certainly in Britain that's lost at the moment is, is the idea that we aspire towards objectivity, whatever the slings and arrows thrown at us, and objective news, news that is not delivered for profit, news that is not delivered to flatter the audience, seems to be a key component of every democracy. And it's more under threat everywhere than ever. But that means we should support it. I yeah. think Dave, David needs to be asked this too, but you, David, you worked on Channel 4 News for quite a few years. You're probably better placed than either John or I to, yes, to talk absolutely. about the subject. Yeah. I mean, what's your, what's your view? Um, on whether news is just adding another, another layer of story. Um, to say that it is, is to, is to, is to give in to a relativism at the start. And I don't think that, I, I think the search for truth is something that cannot be that cannot be fully kind of codified, but you know it when you see it and you know it when you feel it. And and for me, like I'd say the whole of Rebel Wisdom is about that. Like how many we talk about multi-perspectival and how many different perspectives can you include? Personally, I'm sort of, I guess I I've got a kind of Hegelian perspective in that I think the the truth contains the most perspectives. Um but you don't just you don't you don't just get mired in kind of relativism where every perspective is valid. But you do you approach a place where you're like, well, I understand why you think that, and I understand why you think that. But and then you have a kind of meta perspective that incorporates as many as possible. What do you think, Tom? Yeah, like I think you're right. It does kind of just in, it seems to do it just entrench opinions by adding stuff. And I guess the the sad thing about that is. Is, is what you're saying, David, is that it actually takes so much time to do that, which kind of runs counter to how the media is working at the moment, not just like producing it, but how people consume it. 
You know, like if you're going to take in everything and have that aspiration of, of seeking truth, that's going to take so long and you've got to stick with that story all the way through. And by that time, the next thing of the week's already here and just keep it rolling, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Good question. So we've got two uh, similar questions. I wonder if Max um, and James, if you might want to ask them together, and I think I think they'll we can roll them together. Okay. Uh, so John, you mentioned at the beginning that stories traditionally were used to help the tribe uh, survive. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering what kind of story uh, would need to be told today in order for a big uh, tribe to survive? <laughs> well, I think, I mean, it's a very, very good question. I'm not, I mean, I don't know if I'm an expert saying what kind of story. I think what's fascinating is, um, you know, the, 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 you, most countries are having a war of competing stories. Uh, you know, I mean, you see this very clearly in the States between Republicans and Democrats, and you see a very similar thing uh in the uk as well i can't speak really for for anywhere else um it, it's a, it's a, this is a story it, it's a there's a war about story at the moment i mean in the uk i mean in america too the 1619 project is a good example there's a big argument in the uk at the moment about should history be taught to celebrate britain or should history be taught to denigrate britain because a lot of people have suddenly woken up to, oh, maybe the British Empire was not a great thing. And there's that war at work um, at the heart of, of, the, of the democracy we live in. Um, which story, I can tell you which story is going to win, and it's going to be the story that tells you the empire was fine and we shouldn't feel bad about it. It will always win. It's a much more popular story. Nobody, there's never a big mass audience to tell you that you're crap, to tell you yourself that you're racist or you're really bad. It will always appeal to a certain subsection of things, but, but most people will not tune in for that. They don't want to hear it, even if it is true. So that's the story that's going to win. So in Britain, the right, the right to using that story a lot, and it keeps winning them elections. And the left never learn. <laughs> they keep giving the election to the other side by telling less popular stories. Now, you have to be clever how you get around that, and there are ways around it. But so the, you know, it's the same lesson in, in television. Is, is the, the, the stories that people watch are the ones that make them feel good, not necessarily the most truthful. So are you saying the story we need to be told cannot be heard? Uh, yeah, probably. Or you have to find a cleverer, smarter way of telling the story to get people to understand. You know, I mean, you don't win people over by saying that they're idiots or you know, people just turn off. Why would you want to hear that? I don't pay money to be told I'm an idiot. You know, but if you can enchant me and make me trust you and then slowly reveal to me that the prejudices I held maybe are due some enlightenment and not make me feel horrible then i'll come with you and that's the trick which the best politicians understand it's quite depressing really but to take a bright of you um stories uh which are popular stories as you say outside of politics have you know good-hearted people triumphing against the odds and there's a kind of there's a kind of moral education in that. So, so those are, and I'm a humanist, you know, as opposed to, to more than anything else. And the idea that, you know, humans are important, every human is important, and, you know, and that we have to work towards um, human betterment. It's a liberal story. Um, it's a good one. Uh, and it, it's a sort of story that has always needed to be told to get us to live together harmoniously whether people listen to it or not. I mean, you know, Jesus was telling it 2,000 years ago and and probably Homer was telling something less so with Homer, I imagine. But um, but we are, in a strange way, pumping out moral stories, aren't we, still on, on an industrial scale? Uh, yeah, I mean, but that, that story is a meaningless story because, I mean, come together how? Like in a kibbutz or like it, 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 it's sort of white bread 
story, isn't it? I mean, it's lovely and nourishing. And don't get me wrong, I love it. You know, I love those kind of shows as much as anyone else. But they're they're morally fairly bland, aren't they? But don't they have the effect, you know, of of actually seeing a common humanity? Uh, maybe isn't isn't that the purpose of many of these stories? And that's certainly something that the hero's journey posits is that there is a common humanity uh, and that um, that lies at the root, it seems to me, of, of, of many or most stories. They're not going to work otherwise, are they? Because they're not going to work if, if they don't acknowledge common humanity, surely. Yeah, no, I, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. Sorry, that's a boring answer for yeah, you. Yeah, no, okay, no, that's uh, it's I, I like it. <laughs> so I'm going to come to David Fuller's question next, which got one up vote from from Ethan because <laughs> I think he felt sorry for me. Um, oh, yeah. But I was going to ask about taking the advantage of having you here, John. I read the book uh, Difficult Men about the the history of the kind of the TV revolution, like the oh yeah, yeah. the birth of long form television. And what I found fascinating about that book was how it described how the power shifted from the director to the writers because of the nature of, of, of long form television. And I'm fascinated by that as a phenomenon. And I'd love if you could un, kind of explain that and how that happened from the inside. And I guess because story took over, suddenly story was 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 the central um, was the most important factor rather than whatever a director. Yeah, uh, no, I mean, it's, it's, I, mean it, it, I mean, you're absolutely right. And television has been through this extraordinary revolution in the last twenty years. I mean, I think the key thing to remember um, there's there, there's another reason, which is fundamentally an economic reason. For this and economics is at the heart of all of this stuff, really. Which is, uh, yeah, when I grew up and Tim grew up, um, there were only three channels, and they were all free to air. And they, you know, one was BBC funded. Sorry for the English example, everyone, but I'm, that's universal parallels here, I think. Um, but they, uh, the others were advertising funded, and the nature of all those channels was fundamentally they needed a large audience to make money. So what program makers tended to do was go okay well will my mum watch this was the question i heard growing up and telling it all the time and no it's a bit violent or it's a bit aggressive or he's a bit weird let's tone it all down so you get lowest common denominator television very quickly and you're careful and then technology came along first the video cassette and then the dvd and then uh streaming uh streaming video on demand uh and and everything changes because suddenly people can make a huge amount of money by not reaching a big audience. You can make lots of money by being much more niche. And actually that's where long form television comes in. That and the combination of like, in the old days, if you missed an episode, you could never see it again. You know, I mean, that's it, hilariously. I mean, if you're lucky, you'd be repeated seven years later, you know. Um, so there was never long form storytelling because it was economically completely unviable because if you missed the first episode, you could never see it again. If you heard it was really good, you could never find it. So you just got procedural drama, like things like Columbo and Kojak and Ironside and the Waltons, um, story of the week drama. And those are still quite popular, but the re they've been completely superseded by long form storytelling. So it's a product of, of technology and economics fundamentally colonized as the book says by difficult men you know working out their relationship with god yes and um it's certainly led to a new frontier in storytelling hasn't it i mean oh yeah once upon a time you know the most well certainly the longest stories you could find in would be in novels like war and peace and now we're with you know over the last 10 15 years we're seeing these enormous spreads of stories in which the writers and directors can get so deep in, inside a character and, and, and draw and paint on such an enormous canvas. Now that's unprecedented in storytelling, isn't it? I mean, it's a whole new game. Oh, yeah. 
It's it, it, it's extraordinary. It's very exciting as well. It's it, it's brilliant. Although you know, not that many people have found out how to do it that well. That has to be said. You know, it's, it's, it's very hard. It's very it's hard to milk them a bit further than they are worth, worthy of. Or to sustain that volume. I mean, yeah. everyone saw what happened with Game of Thrones, and you could argue the same similar thing happened with The Wire. You know, towards the end. Um, that's not to discredit them because they're extraordinary achievements. But people are just working out how to do that. But also, you know, the thing you don't have in the novel uh, is you're using 25 different writers a lot of the time. Not always, but a lot of the time. And how you you parlay that into one voice. Yeah, people are still working out how to feed volume, how to feed the beast. I sometimes wonder if novels could be written that way. <laughs> well, maybe, yeah. Maybe. Um, you'd make even less money too. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's a point. That's hard to imagine, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is, it's, it, it's all of this comes back to economics as well. I mean, TV, if a successful TV show earns a fortune, I mean ridiculous amounts of money. Uh and, and that's why so many people now want to get into it. So Jessica had a question about uh, just a follow-up from the, from this conversation. Yeah, hi, thank you so much for taking my question. Um, and this is a little bit inspired by the spillover between reality TV, like say The Apprentice positioning Donald Trump as presidential. And sort of, I just was wondering, like, what do you see as a, the story driver with reality TV and how, like, is it casting or is it, do the showrunners like shoot a script and edit for something that they're trying to put a narrative forward or how, how does that work? <laughs> it, it's a great it's a great question i mean reality tv is 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 the great triumph of narrative isn't it, it, it it's and it, there's a really interesting story about reality tv which is like it really came of age during the writer's strike you know like we need narrative fix the writers are all on strike how can we do this well, ah, okay well we'll do this and before they knew it they discovered a whole new form of television so, um, and the, I mean, the heart of it all is 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 triumph over adversity, isn't it? In reality TV, most of it, and it's looking for that story arc, just as in within every episode, be it The Apprentice or The X Factor, you know, you're looking for each contestant to have a beautiful story, which is a it's a Cinderella story, a Harry Potter story, if you like. I mean, they're all built around narrative, and they were. They were an existential. I mean, they sort reality TV has sort of killed off soap opera, um, which was the the quick mass audience narrative fix before that, because because reality TV just does it better and cheaper, and you can do it every week. So it's yeah, it's amazing, but it's all built about storytelling and very good storytelling. Really good. So yeah, I love it, <laughs> even though it destroyed my job. <laughs> <laughs> so. We're going to come to Jeremy Treetops. Jeremy, tell me that is is that your real name or is it just no? It's not. where you are. <laughs> it's, uh, well, it's the name of my production company is Treetops, so it's not my real name. Jeremy Wheelahan is my real name. Uh, th thank you so far for everything. Uh, I guess my question is just to sort of try and dig down into that's I suppose more mythic aspect of storytelling. Uh, which uh, sort of can capitalize catharsis, catharsis or, you know, looking again at the sort of the Greek, under, the, the ancient sort of Greek understanding of story and theater, which was this sort of psychodrama, this work in, in the inner world. I mean, I guess from the Jungian side or James Campbell, who, uh, Joseph Campbell, who was mentioned is that archetypal sort of tapping into those archetypal strands, if that's what we want to call them. But that's the sort of side I'm, I'm really interested in is in terms of the power of story, you know, how do writers, filmmakers, storytellers uh, harness, find ways to harness that power and connect um, the, the story with a small S to, to the story with a, with a big S in a way. I don't know if there's anything there that you can speak to. Well, it, it's it's a great question. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, George Lucas would be the one who who said, "This is how you do it," and did it with Star Wars, if you like. Whether you thought that was successful or not, I mean, he found someone. He found an archetype that he believed worked and spoke to him that he could fit all his anxieties to, and that, yeah, that's a fine way of doing it if you want to do it. I think 
I mean, I'd go, the root of all this is absolute emotional honesty about yourself and your condition and your aspirations and your dreams and how you see the shape of the universe and accessing all of those things. And as you turn that into a narrative, if you're doing that well, it finds that shape, you know, if you're honest with yourself and you can find, you know, you can find the terrible things that stir you, that you need to find peace over, that you need to put to bed, or the knowledge you have to pass on, tapping into all those things. I mean, the hero's journey is really, I mean, just as any religion is, it's about families, isn't it? It's about growing up and mum and dad and your relationship with mum and dad. And it's tapping into the drama inherent in that and blowing it up into a bigger scale so it feels cosmic. Yes, and, and I think also it is a very good question. And uh, uh, I think it also touches on the mystery of storytelling um, because, um, you know, one can only do so much. And John's got a very good point in talking about the ruthless honesty, I think, that is necessary to be a good storyteller, to face up to things that I think many of us are in denial about. Um, Arthur Miller said that uh, the job of drama is to strip away the veils of denial, which has always been one of my favourite quotes about storytelling. Um, so the storyteller has to have that impulse and have that passion, um, which is, goes way beyond the craft of storytelling and into the art of storytelling because you're looking then at, at, at really delving down into your depths to find out what's in there, you know, and, and, and trying to channel something, I suppose. Uh, Stephen King says that, well, he was referring to plots directly. He said that plots are, are not designed, they're uncovered. They're like mm -hmm. buried artifacts that you have to get out of the ground. And I, I yes, I, I certainly, agree with that, that there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a mysterious element to storytelling, you know? I mean, it, it is like, it is like challenging, channeling, channeling um, some, some larger force, I suppose, without being mystical about it. And my, one of my favorite playwrights, Der Dennis Potter said that um, his job as a, as a dramatist was to uh, write things that people know but don't know that they know. And I think that's a very good definition of a, of a great storyteller, is someone, when you see that story, you go, oh, my God, yes, I, I know that, but no one's ever articulated it before. So it's the power of articulation and an emotional articulation that makes a story powerful. And as somebody who writes for a living, I'm always looking for that moment when I can make that transaction, I suppose, where I can find that access, that portal to something that I know but don't know that I know. Yeah. Awesome. So we're coming into the last five minutes or so. I think um, Leviticus, We'll maybe come to your question because it's a good it's a good um, practical question about how to maybe use this mm. in your work. And I'm sure there might be other people, coaches, facilitators, and people in the in the audience who might find this useful. Cool. Yeah. So I'm a relationship and mindfulness coach, and I also facilitate group work. So I'm wondering what are some powerful and simple ways I can apply storytelling to increase inspiration or to increase you know, the meaning that people are getting from the work. Sounds more like something for you, David, maybe. David, are you, you going to take that? or? Well, I can, I can mention how we built – someone actually messaged me in the chat about whether we're running our men's retreats at the moment, and we're not. Tim actually came to and wrote about our men's retreat a year and a half ago, uh, maybe longer, maybe a couple of years ago now. And we very consciously build it around the hero's journey. And we show, there's a short video. I'll, I'll, I'll grab it in a second and put it in the chat. There's a short video. I think it was made for Ted originally that goes through the hero's journey. And so we show it at the beginning and say, we're, this is, and, and we kind of deconstruct it because like so many people know the hero's journey now. So we, 
we use it quite lightly when we actually deconstruct it as we're going through. And after we do some of the exercise, we say, okay, now we're at the mouth of the cave and we explain why it works. It's kind of, it, and I think you have to do it. If you're going to use story structure, I think you need to do it in quite a, you need to kind of show behind the curtain as well. Explain why it works. And, the, and that video does really well at the beginning. It says the reason the hero's journey is so popular and is so powerful is it mirrors every learning experience we go to. We go from the known through the unknown. We, we face challenges. We come back with the gold. And it works It works really well. And I think certainly in the area that, that I'm working in sort of men's work has has used these like warrior king magician lover and the kind of the robert Bly hero's journey mythopoetic men's movement has been a big thing for quite a long time and the reason for for starting up the men's uh, the men's weekends and the men's what we were doing is like it all feels very dated it all feels very super self-conscious and like talking about your inner throne and your king essence and all this stuff and it's like we still refer to those but we refer to those in a slightly more knowing way so i would say that all of that stuff that stuff works for a reason and i think using it consciously reading robert Bly, reading um joseph campbell and going back to the source because i think it's it they are eternal in some way but but bringing it in in a con- in a more conscious way maybe in a in a kind of um yeah in a more in a more um what's the word deconstructed way in some ways but but also just being aware that these are clichés just being aware that they are clichés and they become, but they become clichés for a reason um are there any more questions from people watching this do you have any thoughts about that john like the the how do we bring the stories into our lives in is sort of the the core of that question i'd say yeah i mean i think i think what you're saying is 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 absolutely right i mean you can you the hero's journey structure will always work and i think i think you know you being slightly knowing about it nowadays is probably a very sensible way of approaching it because it disarms people fundamentally we're coming to the end tim did you have any final thoughts or John, did you have any final thoughts before we wrap up? I'd like to ask John, um, before I do that, I'm just going to give myself a plug, timlock.com storytelling mentoring. Have a look if it interests you at all. If you're a writer, um, you might find it useful. Uh, John, I was going to ask you, is there, from a personal point of view, is there any story that has spoken to you above all others? Oh God, uh, that's such a big question. I, I, I don't think I'd be able to ever answer that straight away. I mean, the stories that stay with you are the ones, you know, from, from your childhood, fundamentally. Um, but, 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 but many since I couldn't pin it down to one thing. It's a very, it's a great question. It's also very very unfair so thank you for asking very impossible to answer i know but uh, something that uh, perhaps yeah i'm always very interested in in what speaks to people and uh the messages i suppose that are hidden within stories and they are hidden aren't they that's why they're not lectures you know they're buried in stories yeah. you know the reason what hamlet has to say about human nature is not there in a manifesto it's all buried within the the action yeah that's its beauty isn't it yeah yeah no, um that's all, all i've got to say really david awesome so we shall wrap up so thank you so much to to tim and to john for a fascinating expose on on story we hope you both come back at some point in the future that's it. thank you and fantastic questions as well thank you to everyone and we will see you soon for another session. We'll send out this, this link uh, sometime in the next few days for if you want to rewatch it. And as we traditionally do in these sessions, if everyone would like to unmute themselves, and we will say thank you to Tim and to John, and goodbye and see you next time. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Tim thank you. and John. Thank you. 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 Thank
Thank you for watching all the way to the end. And if you'd like to join conversations like this, check out our digital campfire. You get access to a load of member-only films. You can watch live, ask questions, come to our book club, our wisdom gym sessions, and our regular monthly meetups where we share what's going on behind the scenes. And you can also connect with other Rebel Wisdom members. What's more, you can also get discounts on our courses like Sensemaking 101. Check out the link below and we'd love to see you soon.